What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video, we're going to be talking a little bit about PAD, peripheral arterial disease. This is part of our clinical medicine lecture series. If you guys like this video, it helps you, you, it benefits you, please support us. And one of the ways that you can do that is by hitting that like button. Comment down in the comment section and please subscribe. It goes a long way. Also, really urge you guys to go down in the description box below. We got a link to our website there. We have amazing notes, illustrations. We have developing prep courses for those of you preparing for your step one, your step two, your pants, etc. So please check that out. Also, go get yourself some merchandise. We just have a lot of great things there that I really urge you guys to go and check out. All right, let's start talking a little bit about PAD. When we talk about PAD, peripheral arterial disease, this is a pretty common disease. Now, when we talk about this, I really want you guys to think about it as though there's three particular types. I think it explains the pathophysiology and it cues you right up to understand the causes. So there's thrombotic, embolic, and vasospastic. This one isn't mentioned too much, but it is very important in the critical care world. When we talk about these, we're talking about the peripheral arteries that are being affected. These are usually of the, the actual distal extremities. So for example, upper arm, lower arm, but I'm sorry, lower extremity. But it is way more common to occur within the lower extremity vessels than it is in the upper extremity vessels. So usually what happens is you have some type of narrowing um, of the lumen of these lower extremity vessels that reduces the oxygen supply to the tissues. Now the vessels that are most commonly affected are usually gonna be, for example, here of the aorta, and then it bifurcates into your common iliacs. Usually this is one particular bifurcation that I want you guys to remember. So this is where a lot of disease can actually occur. So this is called the aortoiliac arteries. You can get a lot of like plaques or emboli that can get stuck there. Another one is as we kind of go down your iliacs, your common iliacs will branch into your external, internal, external will eventually become femoral and popliteal. So we'll say that this branch from here to here is gonna be what's called the femoral popliteal arteries. And these are also commonly affected by thrombotic and embolic complications. The last one here is gonna be your tibiofibular vessels. So these are gonna be also relatively affected. They can be hit by some vasospastic disease as well, because usually the vasospastic disease hits the farthest distal vessels. So usually the ones going to like the, the foot um, and usually around the ankle region. So again, this one here, and here would be your tibiofibular arteries. Now, we know that these are the arteries that are most commonly affected in patients who have what's called peripheral arterial disease, or PAD. What is causing these vessels to become diseased? Well, one is a thrombotic complication. And naturally, what can happen is you can have these plaques that occur within the vessel wall, usually due to atherosclerosis. And what they do is they can narrow the actual lumen and make it harder for blood to get through. Look, there's a narrowing point there. There's a narrowing point here. So very little blood flow is gonna be getting through here. And so this will lead to a decreased oxygen supply to the tissues. And this is because of these plaques, if you will. Same thing over here. We can have a plaque. It's really narrowing the actual amount of blood flow getting through here. Sometimes you can even form a thrombus on top of a plaque. So you can have a thrombus that develops on the plaque and that can literally almost offer no blood flow through here. And that's pretty scary. But either way, let's say that in all of these scenarios, what you're noticing is, is that there is a massive reduction in O2 supply to the tissues or maybe no O2 supply to the tissues. If this happens, the tissue starts to become very ticked off. And you know whenever you don't supply oxygen to the tissue, it can actually start to develop something called ischemia. And if that is not reversed in time, ischemia can lead to infarction of the tissue. Now we'll talk about how these patients usually present, but with ischemia, it depends upon the actual degree of ischemia. They may present with what's called claudication, they may present with critical limb ischemia, and they may present with acute limb ischemia. So that's usually the big things to think about, is they usually can present with something called claudication, which we'll talk about a little bit later what's called critical limb ischemia, which will abbreviate CLI, and then acute limb ischemia, which is again, abbreviated ALI. These are gonna be some of the potential findings that you can see and the scary complications associated with this. Now the question that arises is, okay, we, it's a plaque that's developing here. And then sometimes you can have a plaque that actually develops a thrombus on top of it, which really can be super, super scary, right? So this right here, I just wanna abbreviate this, or, you know, highlight this. This is a thrombus, right? So this thing right here, which is this black stuff warming on top of that plaque, that's a thrombus. Whereas 
these here, there's no kind of like black plaque there. There's no kind of clot that's actually forming there. This is a plaque, if you will. So a atherosclerotic plaque. So these are two different things. Plaques can really narrow it. Thrombus on top of the plaque can completely obliterate blood flow. The question that comes here in both of these scenarios is what's causing the plaque to form? Well, the plaque usually forms because of one particular etiology, atherosclerosis. So we have to ask ourselves the question is, atherosclerosis is really the driving factor of these plaques being formed, which is really kind of like making it very hard for blood flow to get through here. What is the particular things that lead to atherosclerosis? And you guys can remember the mnemonic, we're literally gonna repeat it all the time anytime athero comes up, SAD CHF. Smoking is a huge risk factor here. Advanced age is a huge risk factor here. Greater than 55 usually is gonna be one for females, greater than 45 for males. Diabetes mellitus is a huge risk factor. Having dyslipidemia or cholesterol. So if you guys know Rob, who's behind the camera, he has cholesterol that's through the roof. That would be one particular reason. It's under control now. <laughs> The other potential risk factor here is going to be hypertension, so having that high blood pressure. And finally, having a family history is a huge risk factor as well. But all of these things are problematic issues, and this can lead to the increased risk of atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis can form these plaques, but what's the scary complication that can result on a plaque? Sometimes you can rupture the plaque just a little bit, and what can you form on top of this? a thrombus, and that could reduce the blood flow even more or completely cut it off. We'll go into that more in the complication section. All right, so PAD, disease of the peripheral arteries, usually the distal or the lower extremity vessels. We talked about those. We talked it's usually a plaque that forms because of atherosclerosis. In scary scenarios, which we'll talk about a little bit later, you can form a thrombus on that plaque, which obliterates blood flow significantly. The other type of cause of PAD is embolic. So there's this clot that started off as a thrombus somewhere, broke off, and now it's freely circulating through the bloodstream. And then what happens is it maybe goes and gets dislodged in one of these aortoiliac vessels, or it goes and gets dislodged in a femoral popliteal vessel, or it may even go and get dislodged into one of these tibio or fibular vessels. In all of these scenarios, guess what? It is the exact same concept. There is a reduction in the O2 supply. Sometimes this reduction can be to the point where there's literally no O2 supply. And we'll talk about that again a little bit later and because that gets into the degree of ischemia. Because now you're not giving these tissues, muscle tissue, skin tissue, uh, hair tissue, all of these are not getting blood flow good enough. And so they can start to become very, very upset. They can start screaming. They develop ischemia, and this can cause claudication. It's gonna become a recurring thing. You'll never forget this. Critical limb ischemia, depending upon the severity, or acute limb ischemia, depending upon the severity. Now, other things that we will talk about a little bit more in the complication section is that ischemia, we already said, claudication is usually effective not getting blood flow to the muscles that they cramp up, they get really, really tight, they cause a lot of pain. But also think about this. In patients who have this, <laughs> you're also not giving blood flow to the actual skin. It can be cold. They can have less hair the growth. They can also have, again, a lot of pallor to their skin. So those are other findings to think about, not just pain with movement all right, or pain at rest. But this is the concept that I want you to understand here. Now, the question then comes is, what did that emboli come from? There had to be a thrombus that got situated somewhere that then popped off. You're going to pop off. Oh, I almost dropped there. Um, that then broke off into the systemic circulation and caused this problem. One is an atrial thrombus, usually atrial fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation is a really big trigger. Another one, you know this is a complication of post-MI. We call this, after a patient has post-MI, they can develop something called a LV aneurysm. We talked about this in the CAD lecture. Or a pseudo aneurysm is another one but it's a little pocket where stasis of blood flow can occur and you can form a thrombus. And the last one is a triple A, so an abdominal aortic aneurysm. This is the little pocket where it's very, very dilated which you have stasis of blood flow and again, a clot can form. In all of these scenarios, you break a little piece of the clot off, 
break a little piece of the cloth off here, break a little piece of the cloth off here. And all of these now look, boom, I embolize that, embolize that, <clears throat> embolize this, and then these can go and fly down into the aortic iliac vessel, into the femoral popliteal vessel, or into the tibial fibular vessel. Block it off, lead to ischemia, and lead to the complications, which we'll describe later. All right, I think that makes sense, right? The last one I want to briefly talk about because it's not mentioned often, but it is something I see a lot in the critical care world, is vasospastic BED. All right, it's not a thrombus, right, or a plaque. It's not an emboli. It's where the vessels are clamped down intensely. So look at this. In this particular scenario, you have what's called massive vasoconstriction. So these are this vasoconstriction is intense. You see how these vessels are super, super constricted? When you have this intense, intense vasoconstriction, this is usually of the distal vessels, usually for the fingers and for the toes. So when you have a patient who has very, very decreased blood flow, maybe diminished pulses, they have discoloration of their skin, and it's of the distal extremities, and they don't have any plaques or they don't have any emboli risk factors, you wanna think about this, because this can really, really cause very, very little O2 supply. And if the O2 supply is significantly reduced, this can lead to some of the features that we'll describe a little bit later as the result of ischemia. And this could be potentially, one of the most common is this can lead to what's called digital necrosis, where I'm not even kidding, these patients' fingertips start turning black and can fall off. Okay, it's pretty terrifying. So this is some of the things that you can see. Now the question is, is what in the heck is causing the vasoconstrictive process here? We know what caused the emboli, we know what caused the plaques and then the thrombus to form. What's causing this massive vasoconstriction? Again, usually you're thinking about this in the critical care world, so you're thinking about patients who are super, super sick. They are likely in some type of shock. And this is usually shocks that cause reflexive systemic vascular resistance to increase. So their cardiac output's low, so they reflexively constrict their vessels. So in patients who have shock and they have a low cardiac output, they'll increase their systemic vascular resistance. So imagine here you have a patient who has a problem with their heart or maybe a problem with getting blood flow out of the heart, right? So maybe the, let's just say, for example, they're in cardiogenic shock. And because of this, it's hard to get blood out of their heart into the systemic circulation. And because of that, their cardiac output is very, very poor. So if they have a poor cardiac output, one of the ways that your body will try to compensate to increase blood pressure is it'll literally try to clamp down on your vessels to increase the blood pressure. And now what happens is it'll release things like norepinephrine and epinephrine and squeeze down on these vessels. And that's one of the problems here is that it causes massive vasoconstriction. So it's gonna cause massive vasoconstriction. And you're gonna cause very little blood flow to get to the tissues here, right? So that's one potential mechanism here is it's gonna really clamp down on the vessels. The other one is vasopressors. So it's the same concept. A patient is usually on vasopressors because they're in shock. So you see how it kind of like goes together? And they're getting drugs like noroepinephrine or epinephrine or things to that effect that are super rich in alpha-1 receptor activity. And what do they do? They massively increase the systemic vascular resistance, clamp down on the vessels, and now look at the blood flow through this tiny little vessel. Massively reduced. Leads to digital ischemia. So these are the concepts that I want you guys to understand. So when a patient has peripheral artery disease, in other words, they have disease of the lower extremity vessels, think about plaques, which can then become a thrombotic complication, emboli, and vasospastic things. Now let's talk about the complications of PAD. All right, my friends, so we have a patient who has PAD, peripheral arterial disease, right? And now they come to you with particular complications or things that may be concerning for PAD. And again, we talked about how there's thrombotic PAD, there's embolic PAD, there's vasospastic PAD. When we talk about these peripheral arterial disease, oftentimes one of the most common causes of that chronic picture that these patients have is usually that, that plaque cause, that thrombotic PAD, where they don't necessarily have a thrombus that forms on their plaque, they just have these plaques that are naturally within their vessels. And so usually these plaques, again, we already talked about this a little bit, but we'll quickly remind ourselves. 
Aorto Iliac is going to be one of the vessels that's constantly plagued. The other one is going to be the femoropoplidial. And then after that, we come to the last guy here, which is going to be the tibiofibular. And again, what you're noticing here with these particular diseases, with this, this concept of what's called claudication, it's pain. So they have like literally like pain within their calf muscles or pain within their thighs, pain within their hip and buttock area, pain within their feet during some type of exertional activity. So let me explain the concept behind this. In claudication, what happens is you have these vessels that have plaques. They're not completely occluding the actual lumen. They're allowing for some blood supply to get through here, but it's definitely reduced it's much more reduced in comparison to normal patients. So there is a reduction in O2 supply. Now, what happens is, is when you have a reduction in O2 supply, this may cause the tissue to potentially develop ischemia. But this is usually not too bad in patients who are at rest. What happens and what really makes this worse is if these tissue cells decide to increase their oxygen demand. So now what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna tell these tissues, hey, you're not getting a lot of oxygen, but also just to mess you up even more, I'm gonna increase your O2 demand. And so the way that I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna have you exert yourself. So there's gonna be some type of exertion on those muscles. So for example, let's say that you have a plaque within the aortoiliac vessel. Your hip and buttock area, right, are gonna be depending upon that O2 supply, but it's not gonna get a lot. You start walking or doing some type of exercise that uses those muscles and causes them to have to consume more oxygen, more ATP, you're increasing their demand. When you do that and you have a combination of a reduced O2 supply and an increased oxygen demand, this probably should sound familiar in the coronary artery disease lecture. It's the same concept, it's just different vessels. This will produce ischemia because there is a mismatch between the two. And so this is why we see the pain in the muscle, it was just the heart muscle in coronary artery disease, it's the skeletal muscle in peripheral arterial disease. So that's really where this comes about, is this oxygen supply demand mismatch. And this will precipitate things such as pain. And usually this is because of the muscles not getting enough of that oxygen supply. Now, the pain is very particular on your exams to correlate with. So oftentimes, aortoiliac, this will cause, whenever the patient exerts themselves, the ischemia to the actual muscles is usually the hip and buttock muscles. So this will cause hip and buttock pain, usually during exertion. The femoral popliteal supplies more of the calf area. So this will precipitate more of the calf type of pain. And the tibiofibular will cause more of the foot pain. So this is what I want you guys to think about here, is that in these patients, they have plaques. So again, this is usually associated with the claudication, is usually associated with what type of PAD out of all those types, the thrombotic type, right? But again, what I really want you to think about with the thrombotic PAD is they don't necessarily have a clot on top of the plaque, they just have a plaque that's narrowing that vessel. This isn't common in embolic and it's not really common in the vasospastic type either. Now, one more thing that's really, really interesting is if we do something where the supply is low, we don't have an increase in O2 demand. What this may do is you can potentially, so this, all these things will increase the ischemia, right? Increase O2 demand and decrease O2 supply. But if I wanted to decrease the ischemia, what could I do? So where I'm not causing as much pain. So effectively, hopefully my goal would be to reduce the pain. And depending upon where that, that plaqued up vessel is, well, what I would do is, is I would decrease the O2 demand, and I would do that by resting. And if I decrease my O2 demand, what this will do is, 
is this will help this process to decrease the ischemia. So now it'll just be a reduced O2 supply and no uh, increased O2 demand. That won't allow for that mismatch to occur as much. There's one other thing though. When you have less blood flow coming through here, yes, you're gonna get less O2 supply, but less blood flow in general. So here, let's actually do this in two ways. Let's say here we have a reduced blood supply. And as a result, this will knock down your O2 supply, but it'll also knock down just in general, the blood flow through that particular artery, right? So if you have reduced blood supply through these vessels, it reduces the O2 supply and it reduces the blood flowing through those vessels. Why is that important? Pulses. If I check the pulses in these particular patients, what do I expect to feel? A good banging pulse or a very diminished pulse? A diminished pulse because this is reducing the actual blood flow through there. So look for decreased pulses in these patients. All right, so I think we have a pretty good idea now of claudication. Usually again, in thrombotic PAD, not embolic, not vasospastic, and it's usually not a clot that forms on there, it's stable plaques. Reducing the O2 supply through these disease vessels, reducing O2 supply leads to ischemia, especially if there's an increase in O2 demand. But if we reduce the O2 demand by resting, we'll decrease the ischemia and decrease the pain. The next point is critical in ischemia. So again, it's important to understand that with claudication, it's the same kind of concept you can develop pain. It's just with this, it's more intermittent. This we'll talk a little bit more. It's very, very interesting when we get into the pathophysiology here. So same concept, critical in ischemia is usually seen in those patients with that thrombotic PAD phenotype, right? So they don't necessarily have a clot that's formed on top of the plaque. They just may have this stable plaque and it's really, really bad. Like the plaque is nearly almost occluding most of the actual lumen. And so because of that, imagine, here you have an aortoiliac vessel, you have a femoral popliteal vessel, and these poppies are just literally, like look how much room I have here. It's very little. So now blood is gonna be really, really hurting and squealing as it's trying to squeeze through these like tiny little lumens now. And so what I'm gonna notice is the difference here between this and this is the blood supply was reduced. Here, it is massively reduced, okay? So there's a massive reduction in blood supply. Now, that does two things. It reduces the O2 supply, and it also reduces the blood flow, as we talked about before. Big difference is, is that in this scenario, it is massively reduced. So a massive reduction in O2 supply and a massive reduction of blood flow, okay? With that being said, when you have a reduction in O2 supply to the tissue, in this one, it was very, very low. In this one, it was just a little bit low. This one, you required an increase in demand. That's why you get intermittent claudication. This one, you don't need no dang demand. For this one, these patients can develop ischemia at any point, it doesn't matter. This is usually a rest, that's how bad it is. So these patients develop a very severe ischemia to the point where they can have pain. And again, this is usually affecting those muscles, the skeletal muscles in this case, at rest. That is why this one is terrible. Now, if the ischemia is super, super severe, that is what we're gonna see, is we're gonna see pain at rest rather than pain with exertion improving with rest. This occurs at rest. One other big point is that this pain at rest, it's chronic, right? It's chronic, so critical limb ischemia is usually a chronic process. So usually it's persisting for greater than two weeks. I want you to remember two weeks that this pain will continue to persist. Now the muscles are not the only thing that's affected, my friends. When you don't give O2 supply to the tissues, this is not just the muscles. We're talking about hair, skin, so the other things that you could potentially see is you can have ischemia not just to the muscles, but to other tissues. Like, like which one, for example? I could have ischemia to the hair. So patients could have hair loss, right? That's one potential thing. I could also have ischemia to the skin and they could have um, skin atrophy. So these are other potential things that you wanna look for is like really, really thin skin, a lot of hair loss in con combination with a lot of pain. 
Here's where it gets really, really bad. If the ischemia really, really continues, it can actually cause the skin to become undergo necrosis. So now the tissue starts undergoing necrosis. And usually the areas that actually start becoming necrotic are around the lateral malleolus and around the digits. And they really form these like punched out, circular, super, super painful ulcers. And so you're gonna get these things called arterial ulcers. The reason why I'm saying arterial is because there is venous ulcers. And these poppies are painful. And what happens that is really, really bad with these ulcers is that these ulcers can become infected. If bacteria jumps into the ulcer, it can literally cause an infection that can cause the patient to progress into something called sepsis. And so this is usually whenever these ulcers become infected. So you really wanna watch out for that too. So if the patient starts having arterial ulcers, you need to make sure that you tell them, hey, keep this area clean because it can become infected and you can become bacteremic and septic. Same concept is you, if you have a patient with pain at rest, they're starting to have hair loss, atrophy of the skin, you notice some necrosis, you may see ulcers. The worst sign is when their extremities, their digits start literally becoming like black and it starts mummifying in appearance. When this happens, we call this gangrene. This is literally necrosis, but it's what's called coagulative necrosis of the skin. This is called gangrene, but there's two types. One is you usually have what's called dry gangrene, right, which is that kind of like blacking, black mummification of the digits, or the, in this case, maybe the foot. If it becomes infected, and so now that black extremity becomes odorous. It starts having drainage or discharge and it has a lot of like this kind of like nasty looking appearance. Then what can happen is it could mean that that dry gangrene has become infected. And if it becomes infected, this is called wet gangrene. The scary thing is, is that wet gangrene can cause bacteria to spread into the bloodstream and can precipitate sepsis. So these patients are really at risk for some serious disease process and progression. So, so far we see a little bit of a difference here between claudication. The other concept here is the blood flow. This is also very helpful. Pain at rest is key. Evidence of necrosis, like arterial ulcers and gangrene is key. But the other one is obviously here, reduced blood flow, same concept. You will have diminished pulses. They can be really, really hard to almost absent. But here's the other thing you can develop this weird type of sign where they call it Boerger sign. I don't know how to spell it, so I'm not gonna write it down. But this concept here is where the, the actual color of the limb is uh, it's dependent upon positions. So if I lift my leg up, the leg will actually have to, have, have to push blood flow against gravity. And what that'll do is that'll cause the limb to become whitish in appearance. Then when I bring the foot down, I'm letting the arterial flow with gravity and it'll return back to its normal color. And that's a, what's called Boerger sign. And so this is usually where you can actually see positional changes. So positional changes uh, which alter pallor or rhubarb. In other words, whiteness or redness of the extremity. There is positional changes in that extremity. And that's super, super helpful. Again, it's called Boerger's sign. Okay, so now, with that being said, we have a patient who has intermittent claudication, critical limb ischemia. We should be able to differentiate these two now. The last one is acute limb ischemia. Acute limb ischemia, usually for this one, we can see this in two scenarios. The most common is embolic PAD. The second one is going to be thrombotic PAD. And this is where I need to be very specific. And what I mean is, this is not a plaque. This is not a stable plaque. This is a plaque that ruptured and a clot formed on top of the plaque. That's that example I gave in the first prior lecture to this one. Now, when these happen, now look at this. You have an emboli blocking all of these vessels here. Is any blood flow getting through here? 
No. So because of this, you're literally having, we're gonna use this as the most severe example here, little to no blood supply uh, is gonna be getting through here. So we'll put blood supply, because again, we've been using that terminology a lot. All right, so there has been little to no blood supply getting through here. In this example, it was emboli, AFib, left ventricular aneurysm, post MI complications, or aneurysms. In this, it's thrombotic complications. So you have a plaque like atherosclerosis, you rupture the plaque and then form a thrombus on top of that. Either way, all of these things are reducing the blood supply, giving you almost no blood supply. If that's the case, you get almost no oxygen supply and you get almost no blood flow. So now I have no oxygen supply, no blood flow. If I have no O2 supply, or almost very little of it, what is gonna ha start happening to my tissues? They will become ischemic immediately. And it is crazy how intense this can be. So they will develop insane ischemia. And does this have to have any exertional component to it? No. So this may start beginning to sound a little bit like critical limb ischemia, right? They kind of sound similar in the fact that very, very little blood supply, almost no blood supply, quick ischemia with no exertion, quick ischemia with no exertion, usually at rest. Kind of sounds similar. So what we know is this ischemia will cause an insane pain in the muscles, all right? So what we'll see is they will have pain that'll occur in the muscles and it'll be at rest. But to really amplify this, this is more chronic. This is acute. So you can also think about critical limb as chronic limb ischemia, ALI, acute limb ischemia. This is greater than two weeks. You would probably develop this pain in less than two weeks. And that can help you in when they're presenting this in the vignette. If they present this and the pain came on abruptly within the past couple hours, it's not this, it's likely this. All right, that's one thing. The other thing is not only will you have intense pain, Sometimes this ischemia can literally progress to the point where the patient starts to experience destruction of particular tissue. This can really hit the muscle so bad where it causes paralysis of the muscles. So if you really destroy the muscles, you can cause paralysis of them, where it's almost impossible to move the extremity. You can start destroying the nerve endings within the skin and lead to paresthesias. So I could have pain, I could have paralysis, I could have paresthesias. What's another thing that can happen? Again, if this ischemia is bad enough, yes, it can potentially start causing things like, in severe cases, it can start causing necrosis of the tissue. So you may see, if it is not treated and not reversed, you may start seeing some discoloration such as you know, gangrene that's beginning to start to form or necrotic digits, so you may see that. But I want you to really kind of associate this more in your brain with the critical limb ischemia. But you can see this. If we come over here, we had no O2 supply, which gave us pain out of proportion, paralysis if it really started destroying the muscle tissue, paresthesia if he starts destroying the actual nerve tissue, and then we get almost no blood flow. Are you gonna have any pulse if I'm getting almost no blood flow through? No. So these patients usually are pulseless. And if I got no blood flow coming through there, am I gonna have any color to my actual skin? No. So pallor, is another potential finding. And so with this being said, there is one other finding, which is it can cause the skin to have difficulty, if you start causing destruction of it, it can have difficulty regulating temperature, and it's called poikilotherma, but oftentimes some textbooks won't add it. But what this leads to is the common presentation of acute limb ischemia, which is what we call the five Ps. And this is severe, pain, paralysis, which is destruction of the muscle tissue, paresthesias, which is destruction of the nerve endings, pulselessness, which is due to the lack of blood flow, 
and pallor, which is due to the lack of blood giving color to the actual skin. This is the classic presentation of acute limb ischemia. In severe cases, yes, you can develop necrosis, but this is usually at the point to where the patient has gone with a very little blood flow for a long period of time, and they can start developing gangrene, et cetera. But this is the concept that I want you guys to get across here with PAD. So understanding this now, we now have intermittent claudication, critical limb ischemia, and acute limb ischemia. The one thing that you're probably like, Zach, what about that vasospastic type of PAD? Vasospastic PAD can cause acute limb ischemia, but usually it's of the distal like, extremities. And so they can start developing very, very decreased pulses. They can start developing cyanosis or necrosis of the digits. So also think about that one. But this gives you the biggest thing that you guys need to know for PAD with respect to complications. Now let's take a, and tackle the diagnostic approach. Now, with that being said, we have a patient comes in with maybe intermittent claudication. That's their primary chief complaint. So pain when walking, improves when they rest. They have some of the risk factors. They're smokers, they're advanced age, they have diabetes, they have high cholesterol, hypertension, family history. All of these things are super suggestive of PAD. One of the first tests is to get an ankle brachial index. And what it's looking at is it's looking at the blood pressure in the ankle and the blood pressure in the brachial artery. And you're comparing the difference here. Here in the lower extremities, there's these nasty plaques which are reducing blood flow. Here in the brachial, it's a healthy vessel. So therefore, this pressure is gonna be a lot lower. So if you look at this, what will happen is the top number of the ankle brachial index, the ankle pressure will be low, the brachial will be normal, and so what happens is the overall number should get smaller and smaller and smaller. So the smaller the ankle systolic blood pressure is, the more severe the PAD. Where's the cutoff though? So normal is 1 to 1.4, borderline 0 0.9 to not 0.99. Once you get less than 0 0.9, you have PAD, but as you get worse, so generally as we get to like 0 0.6 to 0 0.9, we're in kind of like that really nasty kind of moderate PAD, and if we start getting really low to where it's kind of like less than 0 0.4, then we're getting into the super severe PAD. And so that's really important, but this is gonna be your first line test to obtain. Anything less than or equal to 0 0.9 is PAD, but the lower and lower you go, the more severe the PAD is. Once you've done this and it shows that they have an ABI that's suggestive of PAD, if you really need to, you should assess these patients for revascularization. Indications would be that they're refractory to medical management, they have critical limb ischemia or acute limb ischemia. They need to be revascularized. Ways that we do this is we can do two tests and it depends upon their contrast risk. All right, so do they have a risk of contrast-induced nephropathy? Do they have terrible kidneys? If they do, do a duplex arterial ultrasound. And it'll kind of give you the different velocities of the blood flow and tell you where this actual disease process is occurring, how severe it is. If they don't have a contrast-induced kind of nephropathy or any risk of that, then I would go to the better test, which is an angiography. You can do this via CT. You can do this via MRI. Or you can even do this potentially via digital subtraction angiogram, which would probably be one of the best ways because it'll show you, oh, here's some occlusive material here. Oh, here's some kind of plaques here. Oh, there's an emboli that's a completely cutting off the blood flow of the left iliac. So you're able to tell the actual disease process where the occlusion is, where the disease is, and where you have to attack. Now, once we have done this and we've determined, hey, they have PAD using the ABI, I can even determine the severity of it, I need to assess their risk for revas their need for revascularization, duplex ultrasound or angiography, I've determined the disease, I've determined the severity of it, then I need to treat it. For gangrenous limbs, so those who have critical limb ischemia or maybe acute limb ischemia where the tissue is starting to die and it is no longer viable, you gotta amputate. So it's either above the knee amputation, AKA, or below the knee amputation, BKA, okay? And these are the indications, again, as to why, is that they have wet gangrene, acute limb ischemia, or critical limb ischemia that is no longer a viable limb. Now, critical limb ischemia, again, if the patient is beginning to show needs for revascularization, so they have, again, pain with rest, they have um, arterial ulcers, they begin to have potential signs of like some beginning gangrene, you can consider them to potentially get revascularized. But I would say it's more of the pain with rest, non-refractory, I mean refractory to medical therapy. If they are revascularization, such as using a stent to place in that area or doing a graft or an indirectomy where you cut out the plaque would be the best thing. So either stent the opening, 
provide a graft, which is going to be again an alternative route, or cut the plaque out. So here's the stent. If you do the stent, what happens is when you place the stent, the stent is at risk for thrombosing. So you should put them on dual antipoletals for at least a year, and then after that, the stent thrombosis risk goes down, so then continue them on aspirin. Again, here's an example of a graft you know, kind of bypassing that potential like placked up area, and, or you can cut out that plaque and just get rid of it. With acute limb ischemia, the best thing to do here is actually get them on heparin to kind of prevent the clot from actually propagating and getting bigger. And then you need to send them to get that actual that actual vessel, potentially, whether it's surgically or interventional radiology-wise, they go in and suck that clot out. Sometimes if they can find the area, they can actually inject some TPA into the area as well. But generally, thromboembolectomy, where you go in via catheter or you open up the vessel and pull that clot out is the best therapy they need. For non-critical limb ischemia, which is again, any patient with intermittent claudication, and these patients, it's best to treat the underlying cause. And one of the best ways by doing that is to reverse any of the reversible or modifiable risk factors. Can you stop smoking? Yes. Can you change your age? No. Can you change your diabetes? Yes. So change your diet, change some exercise. Can you change uh, some of the other concepts like, and these patients, Usually their cholesterol is really high. Yeah, I can put them on statin therapy. Can I change their hypertension? Put them on blood pressure medications. And can I change their family history? No. Okay, so those are the things that I can potentially do is change their diabetes, their blood pressure, and I can also help with their diet and also help with getting them to stop smoking. Other things that are helpful is potentially reducing the risk of thrombosis of a plaque. And that is where antiplatelets come into play. Antiplatelets, something like aspirin, would be super beneficial for these patients to prevent. If this plaque ruptures, they get a clot on top of that. That'll lead them to go into a critical or acute limb ischemia. So putting them on antiplatelets is super, super important. Claudication otherwise is best, and I am going to say this again, it is best treated with exercise. Exercise has been, sh been shown to be one of the most beneficial therapies for patients who develop intermittent claudication. Other things that you can consider is if they're on an antiplatelet for, for prevention, there is celostazole. Celostazole is interesting because it's an antiplatelet and a vasodilator. So it'll dilate the vessels and it'll have an antiplatelet function, which will be both beneficial in improving blood flow past that occlusive, occlusive area. So this is the things that I want you to remember for treating peripheral arterial disease. All right, my friends, that covers it. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. And as always, until next time.